It's Eric Edholm from Yahoo Sports joining us right now to talk more about all things NFL. As it's a busy NFL weekend, and of course you can hear all the action right here on 97.3 ESPN. All four playoff games all weekend. Eric, how you doing today? I'm doing all right, man. What's going on? Yeah, lots to talk about. So before we get to the actual like nitty gritty details, I was mentioning before you came on, one of the things that stood out to me about, I think it's getting overlooked is, I just don't think it's a coincidence that the guys who lost last weekend, Jalen Hurts, Derek Carr, Mac Jones, Kyler Murray, all their first NFL postseason starts, Sirianni, first game, Kingsbury, first game, and what do all the current people have in common? They all seem to have experience on some level, so I don't think that it's a coincidence that experience matters once you get to the postseason. Yeah, it certainly has played out that way this year. And, you know, obviously we, we see we're in the middle of uh, hiring and uh, firing season is, is pretty much done, I think. There might be one or two surprise moves. We saw the Ravens obviously fire their their uh, or let their defensive coordinator walk. But, yeah, I mean, for all the, the people who are asking me, why isn't this guy getting fired? Why isn't that guy getting fired? Well, you know, at some point you have to build up some experience and let this thing play out, right? I understand the, the itchy triggy, trigger finger and fans want change and things like that. You know, I think we've gotten to a point where we've kind of overcorrected, right? You know, whereas in the past, we sort of let things play out. Uh, and one way you can see it kind of, you know, have results that, that matter is in the postseason. So, I mean, Kingsbury is an example. You may not love him as a head coach, but, you know, they've improved each year. Like, you know, what, I understand there's, there's in, internal strife and expectations are high, but at some point you have to think that maybe the gradual – approach does work i mean i don't know you know and it's at least a, a decent argument for that <clears throat> of course in our area obviously one of the teams that got knocked out are the eagles and there's a lot of questions out there about what they should or shouldn't do moving forward eric they got three not one not two but three first round picks but the problem is they're all got a bunch together they're all basically in like a seven pick range so you know what do you think of the eagles and having all these picks because we know they need more talent on their team, there's a possibility they might not even use all three. They might trade one of them. But, you know, what does having those picks mean for them? Yeah, I think those picks end up landing in a pretty good spot. You know, everybody assumes, well, higher is better. Um, I don't know that there's a huge difference this year from, you know, where the Eagles pick in the teens to where the teams with picks number, you know, four through ten end up getting. Like, the talent level drop-off isn't that big. So that, that could end up being a good thing. Plus, you know, as badly as teams in the top 10 want to trade down seemingly every year, but especially this year where, you know, I don't think it's a, it's a loaded top 10. The quarterback discussions are going to start playing out, I suspect, and there may be one that goes higher. They always get pushed up farther than we think. But I think some of those conversations will end up having happening Excuse me, when the Eagles' picks come. So... Now that they've said Jalen Hurts is our starter for, for 2022, you know, that, that puts those picks in play, as you pointed out. They may not use all three of them. I suspect they won't. I, I think there'll be some sort of trade activity involved in those. I don't know what, but trading to a team that wants a quarterback in this draft but maybe isn't in love with any of them. You know, they like Kenny Pickett. They're intrigued by Malik Willis. They think Carson Strong can rise up, whatever it may be. You know, Matt Corral, Sam Howell. I could make a first round case for some of these guys possibly that allows the Eagles to maybe pedal these picks and then, you know, look at what defensive needs, what offensive line needs, what other positions of, of, of concern they can address with the other two picks. Let's get to the quarterback as well, because you know, you just mentioned, they said Jalen's our guy in, in our area, it's very polarizing because half the fan base saying, see, they finally committed to the guy, right? You know, they have the <laughs> fan base is like, this is coach speak. They're going to do something, right? So should they be committed to Jalen Hurts? Does it make sense for them to be committed to him going in the next year, Eric? I think it's a, a decent approach. I really do. I think there's a chance that the, <clears throat> the 2023 quarterback class could be a lot more fruitful. So what you do is, is twofold. You let it play out right now, and assuming they hang on to Minshew, you know, you have a pretty good contingency plan in place, a better, you know, number two than a lot of teams can boast right now. And then you can start thinking about the possibilities of 2023. That's why earlier when I mentioned, hey, 
trade one of those first round picks to a QB needy team, get a 2023 selection or ammo in that draft, whether it's multiple picks or one in the first round or what have you. And then you can be in play for Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Grayson McCall from, from uh, coastal Carolina is an intriguing guy. You know, Tyler Van Dyke is a name from Miami that I think is gaining some steam and will next year too. To me, the possibility of those guys panning out is higher than the six or seven decent, respectable, but maybe not thrilling quarterback selections here. So you, I think you can accomplish a lot of things. And I think that, you know, Howie Roseman's an analytics guy. He's a numbers guy. He's a, a planner and a, and a, and a, a projector, I would say, in, in a lot of ways. And that can work out really nicely in his hand if it, if it plays out that way. So, you know, if we said Hertz hasn't developed, hasn't shown any kind of promise, we'd be lying, right? I think there's, a, there's at least some evidence that while he may not be ready to conquer the world tomorrow, there's at least upward mobility and you can kind of let it play out a little bit. I know the slow and steady approach is not what people want to see. They want instant results, but the, this might be one way of going about it while also giving him time to develop. If he develops, great. Then you have extra ammo and you can figure out what to do with it next year. So uh, I don't think, you know, this is a case of kicking the can down the road. I think this is a case of, of letting the system kind of play out a little bit and seeing what you have. Eric Edholm from Yahoo Sports joining us here on 97.3 ESPN. Of course, you can follow him on Twitter for all of his NFL and NFL draft analysis at Eric <laughs> underscore Edholm. Eric, you mentioned the quarterbacks this year. You know, we were just having a conversation earlier. We had somebody call into the last show about Kenny Pickett. I just got a message coming call. The guy DM the show talking about Kenny Pickett. You know, I lean toward what you said. I don't think this is a great draft player. I'm not saying Kenny Pickett's a bum. But right. I think people are forgetting that Kenny Pickett had an extra year of eligibility. That's why he was able to break Marino's record. It wasn't because he's better than Dan Marino. Like, right. to me, I, a, anybody who thinks that Kenny Pickett breaking Dan Marino's record puts him in Dan Marino's stratosphere, <laughs> I think, doesn't didn't see Dan Marino play. But, right. you know, so who and what is Kenny Pickett? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's important to know where scouts viewed him coming into the season. He was given mostly third and fourth round grades entering – the 2021 college football season. Now, you know, a generation ago, Carson Palmer was getting the same things and he went number one and ended up having a really nice career. So that last year jump, Joe Burrow is another great uh, recent example. Burrow was getting fourth and maybe even fifth round selections coming into his final season. And then he, he blew up the world. So with Pickett, it's not quite that same level of excitement, but there are some traits Pickett has that Burrow also has. Toughness, quick, uh, you know, diagnostic ability, decent athlete. I wouldn't say he's quite as good an athlete as Burrow is. Um, you know, competitive, occasionally loosey-goosey with the ball, right? I mean, he throws some balls that uh, into harm's way, but not a ton. I mean, uh, just an occasional willingness to take a chance that sometimes backfires on him. You know, we saw him on that fake slide run. That was obviously a moment that I think kind of helped you know, solidify him in the, in the spotlight this past fall. Uh, it also shows that he moves pretty well. I don't think that's going to be a major weapon for his game, but like Burrow, he can escape from trouble. I mean, that that's, I would say he's somewhere on the, on for the high end, like the, the best he could become would be a poor man's Burrow, uh, you know, maybe a Kirk Cousins or Derek Carr type of quarterback um, where, you know, they move a little bit, uh, they get rid of the ball and put it in, in good places, and they put up 4,000-yard passing seasons. The low end would be, you know, he's, he's a guy that you're looking to move on from, like a Teddy Bridgewater type where, you know, is he good enough to start? Yes. Are you always going to look to replace him? Probably. So that would be the, the lower end projection for him. I feel pretty good about him being a first-round pick. I know some people have suggested that maybe he slips out, but if there's a, if there's a safe – solid, respectable, upside choice. That That's probably it in this draft. Eric, for me, I think the Eagles, they need to go defense. I think it's mm -hmm. very obvious they just don't have the firepower. They don't have enough dudes, and they're losing almost their entire secondary. They have Anthony Harris, Roddy McLeod, and Steven Nelson. They're all free agents. So who are some guys that make sense who are going to be maybe in that, like, you know, 10 to 20 pick range that the Eagles, if that guy is there, you're saying if you don't draft him, Howie, you're an idiot. 
<laughs> I never call anybody an idiot, but yes, I know that <laughs> occasionally, occasionally happens in your neck of the wood, right? Um, it, it's really fascinating in, in the secondary. I think safety is a position that I would rather attack early than late. It's not a position that has great depth this year from, from my vantage point. Um, and others may disagree, but uh, I think once you get past the sort of top five or six guys at that position, then maybe even top four or five, there's a drop off. So Kyle Hamilton, almost certainly gone. If he's there at somehow there at, at what do they pick? 13th is their first choice. Take him. Don't even think about it. Right. Don't worry about the positional value because like Kyle Pitts, you know, in the debate about taking a tight end at number four overall, there's a, this is, I think, as close to a no-brainer as it gets, but I don't suspect that's going to happen. Then you get into the discussion of Daxton Hill, who can play some nickelback and also play as a safety. Lewis Seen from Georgia, I'm a big fan. He's a big kid and a hitter. You know, he can, he, I think he can do some stuff up in the box and also be a matchup safety. So would I be taking him with my first first rounder? Probably not. Maybe with that last pick, I would consider one of those guys, maybe. But more likely, you're going to be looking at corner. And it's a good year for corners, too. There is depth, but there's also some really interesting first-round talent. The guy that I would probably suggest, you know, and again, depending on what happens with, with uh, you know, Jonathan Gammon's got defensive, you know, has had uh, head coaching uh, interviews. It's possible he leaves, not knowing 100% what kind of system they want to run. The two players who I think fit best in that range, uh, maybe three, let's say three. Derek Stingley from LSU, questions about his health and the fact that he hasn't played at an elite level the last two years because of injuries and, and different things. I mean, he's had limited experience the last two years. If you watch the player as a freshman, he looks like a top five pick. 2019, when they went to the title game, he had some great games, great performances. The last two years left a little bit of a, a bad taste in some evaluators' mouths. So I don't know that he's the top 10 slam dunk. Some people think he is. He's going to be in play, I think. Andrew Booth from Clemson is a really good player who, you know, outside of one or two games, I want to say the NC State game wasn't his best. There were some other games that I thought, you know, maybe he's a, a good player, but not an exceptional one. I, other games where you say he's got some real high end ability and he's got some playmaking ability. I think uh, Booth from Clemson, not a, the biggest guy, but I would I would take him safely in that range too. probably the third one. Not every team agrees on him, but. Ahmad Gardner sauce is what, you know, people he goes by. He, he's going to be a, a, a top 10, a top 20 possibility uh, in some teams uh, beliefs. Other teams might have him a little, you know, more on the late first, early second round uh, spectrum. He's a long corner. He fits more of kind of a, a zone reroute. The guy at the line, use that length. Um, you see him sometimes play, uh, he doesn't really get beat deep, which I appreciate about him. He never gave up a touchdown in his three years of starting. Um, is Does he have long speed? I don't know. But those are the three names that I would probably suggest have the best chance to kind of go in that, in that Eagles first round range. Eric, let's flip it over to the teams that are still playing because, mm -hmm. you know, everyone wants to talk about all these different variables. And one of the things I think is most curious is this weekend, we're going to see the future of the league all playing it's burrow it's mahomes it's josh allen and you just mentioned earlier burrow coming into that year was not a first overall first round pick guy he yep. turned himself into that and now he's joe cool he's all these nicknames right you know josh allen horrible him and mahomes had horrible mechanics in college right. and they they've developed into these elite quarterbacks you know what does it say about <sighs> the league now that in a world everyone wants their their mac and cheese in one minute or less and they can't wait for it, you know, that you have three quarterbacks, one sat, one basically evolved into this, you know, multi-threat weapon, Josh Allen, and then you yeah. have Joe Burrow who was a nobody at Ohio State just a few years ago. Yeah, and really not a nobody, but a, but a, a just a guy the year before. I mean, he yeah, Alabama, you know, uh, embarrassed him i would say the in in 2018 right and, and we're and i'm gonna pour one out right now for uh justin herbert please i hope we get to see this kid have some team success too he's too special not to include in that quarterback discussion but you're right sure. i mean the quarterback development evaluation process is 
it's very skewed depending on the player, right? We we expect the same kind of results. And I love your your mac and cheese, uh, uh, you know, analogy there. It makes so much sense too, right? Some mac and cheeses need to be sitting in the oven for a little bit, right? And bake and get that little golden crust on top, right? And, you know, Josh <laughs> Allen's rookie year, I don't think anyone was going to look at him and say, boy, that's the future of the NFL right there. They saw some really exciting moments. And that's why I'm patient with Jalen. I mean, with Hurts, I mean, I feel like, you know, I always liked him in college. There were there were warts, there were flaws, and that's kind of the same way I felt about Josh Allen. Allen was my number 17 prospect. I, I didn't think he'd be a superstar, but it was obvious that he had superstar kind of weaponry in, in his in his arsenal. I just thought he was way too inconsistent. So that debate is so fascinating to me, right? Deciding what traits can overcome some little flaws and what traits can, can develop into these kind of superpowers. Scouts often use that phrase when they, when they talk about prospects. So yeah, with, with Burrow, it certainly is anticipation and his toughness, you know, and he's got a little bit of everything else to kind of well round the game. Yeah, Mahomes is obviously a wizard and, and Allen has developed into a, you know, one of those premier quarterbacks. So yeah, I feel like, you know, that's, you know, for the teams that draft the Mac Joneses, right. How high is the ceiling? And he's a good player. He's clearly showed it as a rookie, but that debate's going to come into play with Pickett. That deb- debate's going to come in with some of the other quarterbacks out there this year. And it, it exists for a lot of other teams that find themselves on the outside looking in, I think. Why don't you think we don't we talk about the intangibles not enough? I feel like, you know, leadership is a big deal in the NFL. You know, you mentioned Hurts. The big reason why I'm a, I don't want to say I'm a Hurts guy, but I, I, believe he needs a second he needs more time is because the other players in the locker room bought into yes. him they voted yep. him a team captain they won they followed him to the end you know the players they love him I mean Lane Johnson has him working out with him in his in his room with all the other offensive linemen like that's sacred land for offensive linemen and I know you bring yes. the quarterback in there you know he's deadlifting like 600 pounds you know so it's <laughs> like you know to me the leadership intangible is so important and I look at Mahomes. I look at Josh Allen. Those dudes follow those guys. Like those players love those dudes. Why don't we talk about the intangibles enough? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, I don't know if you remember. This is not to to put Allen. I don't want to put Josh Allen in in a in a bad light at all because there was there was he had had a tweet when he was I don't know like thirteen or fourteen years old or something like that. That was, you know, let's face it, kind of a racist tweet. And he had to explain himself. And it it surfaced right after he got to Buffalo. And the immediate reaction was because a lot of people didn't like the pick at first, too. I think they were saying, he's not going to win that locker room over. No chance, no way, no how. He went in there. He faced all of them and said, look, I was a young kid. I was dumb. I tweeted something dumb. I'm not the same guy anymore. And he faced it straight on. And I, I mean, in talking to people up there, they said he couldn't have handled it better. And I think from that point on, He's just incrementally built up this 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 faith and this trust in his teammates. Like they've seen how many big hits he's taken. They've seen how many big time throws he's made in key situations. He's not perfect every week. You know, he has some down outings, that sort of thing. But he keeps rallying and fighting. And Burrow, same thing, the toughness. Mahomes, right? I mean, that Super Bowl he played against the Bucks when they lost 31-9 or whatever it was, he played an amazing game. I mean, he was making these sidearm diving throws that his receivers were dropping and he was getting hit every other play. So those kinds of things, when they built up over time and and guys have seen the work they put in and seen the natural leadership qualities they have. That's why for me, Jalen was a top 50 prospect for me because I thought one way or another, he's going to win people over. He's going to work on his weaknesses and he's going to develop in some way. He's never going to be the best quarterback in the league. I was confident in that. However, you don't always need the best quarterback. You need the quarterback who can get everybody to buy in and has enough ability to stress defenses consistently. And that's what I thought he could do in college and what I've seen at least in partial in, in, uh, in the NFL so far. So yeah, I, that intangible quality, Brady, obviously, I mean, we don't talk, you know, we just assume everybody knows right. that Tom Brady has those qualities, but they come in different forms, different personalities, different styles of leadership. But Scouts always say, like, you, you know it when you see it. There, there's the phony stuff, and then there's the real legit. No, this guy is somebody I would go to battle with. And, and a lot of the ones we have left, I think, fall into that category. Absolutely. Eric, before I let you go, you're over there in the Chicago area. So uh, who who's coming? Like, who's? I, I feel like I've heard about every other team's 
interview situation except for Chicago. Like, I feel like Gaddon is getting a second interview with the Texans, right? Joe schoen has been hired by the Bills. Yeah. You know, Brian Flores, apparently he's interviewing with everybody at this point. Yo, know, I, I heard the report other day, no offense to the NFL Network, but what a guy of the NFL Network. George Payton has a, has a vast net he's sending out of interviews. Yeah. And I'm like, I feel like Chicago is like the forgotten opening. Well, it, it, it's funny because they've interviewed so many different people every day. It's like, well, we've completed interviews with this GM and this head coach, this GM and this head coach. The list has grown so long, which scares me. I don't, I don't like big lists. It almost feels like when you do cast the big net that you don't know what you're looking for. Or you don't know exactly who should be, who should be brought in. You know, I'm all for bringing in lots of different types of candidates and, and, you know, measuring apples versus bananas and trying to decide, do we want, Someone who's you know great with the financial stuff understands the big picture of the uh, the analytics, or do we want like a scout scout, you know, a dyed in the wool talent evaluator? Those are you know both viable systems, right? I I just I'm fascinated to see what they end up with because they've just interviewed so many different people and it doesn't always work out. Yeah, I, I, one of the debates also in our area is because Doug Peterson used to coach here, and we all yeah. have been having this debate of yo know, which job makes more sense for Doug, you know. Because, you know, Doug had, you know, he won a Super Bowl. You know, he's not some right. schlep, you know. And, you know, the assumption is, at least in our area, that there's three jobs for him. It's Chicago, it's uh, Jacksonville, and it's Miami. Jacksonville. You know, yep. those are the three that everyone assumes. And, you know, for me, to me, I don't even take the Dolphins job. I've already said that I think Stephen Ross is an imbecile. And I think that guy, should, no one should want to work for him. Like, firing Brian Flores was the dumbest thing they could He chose... <laughs> The coach the players liked. They fired him, and he kept the GM, who has made some questionable decisions over the years. So, yep. to me, if I'm Doug, it comes down to Jacksonville and Chicago because they both have the two quarterbacks. Yeah, and 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 it, the the best thing about Chicago is that they're hiring a new GM too. And he, if they go head coach first, he might be able to have some say on who they bring in. Or I've worked mm. with this guy before. I can tell you he's great at what he does. Jacksonville, you know, there's questions about Shad Khan too. And Trent Baalke is still in his position. So it may not be that vastly different, even though they have different, you know, roster strikes and differences than what the Dolphins offer. I, you know, the, the head coaches who've been in this league and have been in that position and have to deal with management and ownership and, you know, get involved in power struck, you know, struggles. I think they're a lot wiser about looking top down, right? How good is this owner? How much do they interfere? How much do they meddle? How much are they going to give me say on things? then go down to the, the the upper management and the front office and whatnot, as opposed to saying, who's my quarterback? What's the salary cap? How many draft picks do we have? Those are all important things, but I don't think as important as, as the top down approach. So it, it's fascinating to see and all these moving parts. We only have one GM pick so far. So it's, it really is interesting. I don't know. Maybe all these GMs will have good PowerPoints. That's why it's taking these teams so long. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get a PowerPoint guy to work on it. For well, that's you, what I'm right? saying. I, I was saying earlier, Eric, I was saying, you know, I think Jonathan Gannon must have the best PowerPoint because the Texans <laughs> want to interview him twice. And I, I think he got some tips from Brandon Staley because Staley, his buddy, just got the job with the Chargers, right? Yep. So, and you know, they were in each other's wedding together. So it's like, you know, he, maybe he said, hey, you, this is the PowerPoint presentation to get you the second interview. <laughs> it is an ancestral <laughs> league, too. Let me tell you, it's all about who you know as much as it is what you know. And right. you find that out as you, the more you cover this league. So it, it just, it is funny how these connections are, are made and kept and, and they end up working out for a lot of people. Yeah, the, when the news came out this week that Nick Casario and John Gannon both went to the same college, John Carroll, Everyone, everyone was like, oh, there it is. You know? There it is. Yeah, I know. Well, somebody else pointed out, too, like Ryan Poles, who's a, the Chiefs uh, director of scouting, you know, uh, played left guard with Matt Ryan at Boston College. He might be interested in trading for him. Yeah, connections matter. Let's not go overboard here. Just because you play tight end on a D3 school with a guy who once went to college there, too. I don't know. That's always going to be a, a, a smart uh, aligning of uh, forces right. there. <laughs> He's Eric Edholm from Yahoo Sports. Give a follow on Twitter at Eric underscore Edholm. Check out all of his NFL and NFL draft coverage over with Yahoo Sports. He joined us right here on 97.3 ESPN. Eric, enjoy the football this weekend, and we'll talk soon. Yes, sir. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you soon.